Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here, and on today's episode I'm going to be reviewing two Blu-rays. Now I don't tend to review Blu-rays on my channel, I often do like Laserdisc pickups or the odd kind of random video on something I've just recently purchased. But today I thought, well, let's discuss the recent Screen Factory releases of Robocop 2 and 3. Now Robocop 2 and 3, uh, have been given pretty poor treatment when it comes to DVD and Blu-ray over the years. They never had any special features, audio commentaries, all you're gonna get is like a theatrical trailer. Um, just announced a couple of months ago that Screen Factory were doing these special editions and I thought, well, I've gotta grab them as soon as possible. Well, let's kick it off with Robocop 2. Now, with all Screen Factory releases, you can reverse the cover. So you've got a theatrical poster, where well, you can stop it around and you get the new artwork. Um, with this set, you get new interviews with the cast and crew. You get a commentary by Paul M. Salmon, who worked at Orion during the 80s, and I think, I believe, in the early 90s, possibly, working as a PR and doing loads of other jobs on the production. And he shot tons of behind-the-scenes material at the time. And some of that does show up on the disc itself. It often cuts to kind of uh, disc clips on the material he shot, or you get like a separate chunk. Uh, we get an interview with John Davison at the time and it sort of goes along into um, parts of the production and you actually get to see some of the deleted scenes where you see Peter Weller as Robocop going to his grave which was only available in um, sort of like a on-set photograph but this you actually kind of see uh, the shoot itself you know, which was fascinating with the interviews they're quite open and honest they're quite candid about the production not, they don't really hold back um, the majority of the people on, on Robocop 2 really enjoyed making the film. Uh, Nancy Allen, you know, also was frustrated with how her role was reduced at doing the sort of the script rewrites because every day they were changing the script, which you should never really do. I mean, because because Robocop 2 was such a rush production, Orion Pictures wanted more, you know, wanted to increase their profits quickly because they were having they had a number of flops at the time, and Robocop 2 was the one to sort of you know bring that money back in and uh, boost their profits. And because of the rush production, and it was a non-union deal, so Irvin Kushner kind of jumped on at the last minute, um, you know, with Frank Miller writing because he wasn't part of the Writers Guild, you know, they've got a comic book writer to sort of contribute. And I think Alan Moore was asked to do the script for Robocop 2, which he said no, flat out no, he wouldn't do it. Um, so Frank Miller was, you know, very happy to jump on board and sort of, you know, contribute to this new sequel. Frank Miller was very open to change it so on, on the set they would change a lot of the story and, and Erwin Kushner would contribute as well um, and it's surprising a lot of the people involved in the production especially with the special effects and things like that were very uh, very positive on Erwin Kushner and, and, and his role as director because he came on to the onto the shoe at such a late stage um, you know he managed to hold it all together and keep the tone generally consistent and uh, get the shots done and keep, keep the movie on schedule. Also with some of the other extra material you get an interview with comic book writer Stephen Grant who'd adapted Frank Miller's Robocop 2 script into a comic. Um, now I do recall reading bits of it, also, no I saw bits of it as a kid, like it was actually quite expensive to get now, it's a Frank Miller kind of graphic novel of Robocop 2. Um, I think it's out of print for, it's, well it's been out of print for a long time. Well they did do Robocop 3 later on in the years and it was, and it was actually a better graphic novel. Um, in terms of the picture quality of the disc, it's a new 2K scan for Robocop 2. Uh, the picture is a lot better than the last release of Robocop 2. But to be honest, Robocop 2 has always looked pretty good. Uh, I used to have the old widescreen laser disc of Robocop 2 and it looked fantastic on that. And um, it's, a, it's a movie that's always looked pretty good when it comes to the home video kind of formats. And this is the best it's looked so far. Uh, sound quality wise is fantastic. I mean, a lot of people aren't a fan of the score to Robocop 2, but once you kind of you see that great sequence where the car gets destroyed at the beginning and he steps out of the you know of the police car it's all destroyed and stuff and you see his foot slam down. I mean that was just a, one of the greatest moments in the film and the music kicks in and that's the moment where I love the score. We also get some interesting kind of you know trailers and TV spots which were, which were quite funny because at the time they were trying to you know, sort of push this kind of battle against drugs uh, with the government and trying to and doing sort of promotional clips to sort of discourage children from taking drugs. And you've got Peter Weller kind of talking to camera and trying to, you know, say drugs are bad and stuff like that. And then there was, you know, thank you for not smoking, um, ident or kind of mini trailer that show before films. And it's a bit where Robocop shoots the guy and the bullets go around his head, just avoiding him. And he goes, thank you for not smoking. And um, 
that's that's on the disc as well. The retrospectives itself, I mean, they're, they're probably about 35 minutes each. You get you get one on for Robocop 2, that's called Corporate Wars, about 35 minutes, and then you get one on special effects, which is very very detailed. I mean, actually, probably more detailed than the Corporate Wars making of itself. There is a lot of interviews with the guys who did the you know, stop motion for Kane and the Robocop doing a sort of battle at the end. And uh, Phil Tippett was very open and honest about everything. I mean, uh, there's a long running kind of theme throughout that everyone kind of loved working on the film, despite its overall qualities at the end. Um, I think most of them kind of consider it sort of the, the, the violence a bit in bad taste, where it was kind of lacking some of the satire of, of the original and it seemed a bit mean spirited. Um, and that's, thing, that's what's been levelled at Robocop 2 for years. Um, it's never quite been even with its satire, and it's not as funny. Um, but it is, you know, not, it's hard to say it's not as violent, but I mean, it's, it's not as gory as the first one, but it's kind of how you see that, and how it kind of, how the, and how the characters treat each other often lends itself to being kind of um, a bit too dark and a bit too mean-spirited. But also with this desk, you get an extra commentary by the producers of the upcoming Rubber Doc documentary, which is out later this year. The guys involved is producer Gary Smart, uh, director Chris Griffiths, and editor Eastwood Allen. And now these guys did this Kickstarter, I think, about last year, to sort of this new kind of documentary on Robocop. And so far, they've got interviews with dozens of people involved in the movie. And um, the documentary is going to be ridiculously long, uh, so they tell me, because they interviewed me about a year ago. Uh, to discuss my thoughts on the trilogy and the video games and how it's kind of you know, been within pop culture and 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 people's feelings on the movies now and um, despite you know Robocop 1 being so popular everything afterwards is kind of just tailed off um, people are still interested in Robocop so that that will be out later this year but these guys provide um, a very interesting commentary I mean they, they know their stuff they've obviously they've interviewed all these people and they're all obsessed with with the series um, but it is, it is very much like a fan commentary, um, very much like you know me, Richard, and Duncan do for my channel. But I think theirs, theirs was you know a lot more full of interesting information, and um, and you get the great sense that they're all great friends. So it's a little bit more kind of um, enjoyable to listen to and less cold than the regular commentary you may get with these with these kind of DVDs and Blu-rays. So it's definitely worth checking out their contributions to the set. Paul M. Salmon, who I mentioned earlier, provides a great commentary to Robocop 2. It's full of fantastic trivia and information. He knows, it's, it's interesting to know that he knows so many people in, in the industry and is passionate about the you know, subject material and he comes up with loads of interesting stories despite you know him not being a cameraman or director or writer, just being someone who's kind of on set shooting a lot of behind the scenes material and promoting the movie. He, he's very well informed. I mean, if you're a fan of you know, Robocop 2, I mean, this is, you know, you'd be stupid not to get it. Um, I mean, price-wise, it's only about $25. You can probably get it for less, depending on what website you buy it from. Um, but let's discuss Robocop 3. Now, this movie uh, doesn't really have many fans. There are a couple of fans out there. Um, I've warned, actually, as a kid, I quite enjoyed this movie. I did have a poster of it on my wall uh, when I was uh, maybe about 12, 13. I was very stupid. And, uh, um, but because, you know, it was the problem with the film, obviously, it was aimed at a younger audience. It was a PG 13, um, so a lot of violence is being cut out. Well, not even cut out, just wasn't shot. Um, it was all shot in a way to be aimed at a younger audience. Now, the Blu-ray itself comes with a new interview with Fred Decker, uh, Nancy Allen's involvement, uh, Patrick Crowley, also the producer, took on a larger role in, on this film, and an interview with Bruce Locke, who uh, plays a new cyborg that Robocop has to battle. Obviously, there's interviews with some of the visual effects guys as well, who are involved in sort of, you know, kind of animating Ed 9 again, and obviously designing the, the jetpack and the new gun he has, and discussing some of the visual effects, like the flying in the end, which is... Um, well, the blue screen is probably a bit better than Superman 4, but um, it's not b brilliant, is it, when you see it? But I think the problem they had, they say in, in the interview, was that because his actor's in the suit, and you've got the jetpack, and you've got to high, you know, hold him up with wires, there's so much weight trying to hold him up, and then trying to get the shots done and make him move around. And a lot of what they'd shot ended up being cut out, and just been, they ended up using this uh, stop-motion version of Robocop, as you see him kind of you know fly around and then kind of fly towards the cops and sort of shoot off. Um, 
It's always funny as a kid when you see when your Robocop comes smashing through the OCP building at the end. You always see big chunky wires just sort of holding him up or when he picks up the little girl and flies away. I think it's because it's matted with widescreen you can't actually see the wires but when you watch a pan and scan version of Robocop 3 you can see the big wires kind of pull him out, pull him out of frame as he escapes before he explodes. Um, but the, the best thing about this disc, Robocop 3, is the interviews with Fred Decker. He's so open and honest about the problems with the film. Anyone who dislikes the movie and you know blames certain individuals for its problems, he openly admits that it was all his fault. Uh, he was given freedom to do a lot on the movie. You know, he wrote, he rewrote what Frank Miller did, and but also you know Patrick Crowley, um, who produced the movie. He he said they were very much restricted uh, when it came to shooting the movie because it had to it had to be a PG-13. So trying to shoot Robocop as a PG-13 movie was incredibly difficult. And I, I still don't think it can be done. Um, I, you have to be a very talented writer to sort of make it work. And um, I suppose nowadays you can probably be, probably be, you can probably get away with a lot with a PG-13. Years ago, it was a lot more difficult to sort of appease a certain demographic um, or keep within those guidelines to, you know, for it to be a safe movie for children. Um, Robocop 3 in the UK was rated a 15. And that was, you know, a very tame 15. I mean, nowadays, if it was a 15 now, a new Robocop film, you can probably get away with quite a lot. Fred Decker, you know, he says in the audio commentary to the film that he still has nightmares about the shoot and, you know, how the whole film went wrong. I feel so sorry for Fred Decker because, you know, he'd done, you know, Night of the Creeps and Monster Squad, both movies that didn't do very well at the box office. And he was struggling with his career and he was luckily able to get work on Robocop 3 because because of Monster Squad it appealed to a kind of younger audience but it kind of had that sort of adult vibe to it so you got this tone that would that could translate to Robocop 3 in going with a sort of lower rating but you know he, he blamed himself for everything and you know his career was basically fucked after Robocop 3 you know he sat on the shelf as well for a couple of years and, um, it was delayed with, it, with its release. So when it came out, you know, you've got Jurassic Park, you've got, you know, T2 had came out a couple of years ago, but when you look at the visual effects and, and then compare them to Jurassic Park, you know, or movies of that year, you know, Robocop 3 looks, looks incredibly cheap, despite it not actually being a cheap film. I mean, if it, when it hit, you know, if it came out in 91, which it was probably intended to do, maybe early 92, it probably wouldn't have received the drubbing it did. Um, I don't know, this is all in hindsight now, but... I mean, the Robocop 3 collector set isn't as detailed as the Robocop 2 one. I think they had more to say on that. And there's less people interviewed for the Robocop 3 one. But I believe the upcoming Robodoc documentary will include more individuals involved in that film. Um, so, it's these, these sets are a good starting off point. I think, you know, if you are an avid Robocop fan and you, were, and you are aware of the Robodoc coming out. The extra material on these is, is more than adequate for a movie buff anyway. If, if you're not a huge fan of Robocop and don't need to know that much about the behind the scenes material, I mean these will satisfy uh, most people. I mean if you're a hardcore fan watching extremely detailed information, I think the, probably the best stuff actually is probably listening to the audio commentaries because they, they can throw out more details and stop be restricted to a running time of say, say 30 minutes or 35 minutes. Um, but sadly, on both sets, I don't interview uh, Peter Weller for Robocop 2 and Robert Berg for Robocop 3. Peter Weller, I believe, refuses to talk about Robocop anymore. So he's done. He's done with discussing the movie. Uh, and there's quite a lot of interviews out there with him anyway, discussing the first film, but not really discussing number two in great detail, which is a shame because I think there's more to sort of you know, divulge into, you know, his thoughts on the making of the film. But I, but I do believe uh, Robert Burke will be interviewed for the upcoming Robo Doc documentary. So hopefully we can get his kind of opinions on his experience on making the film because he was restricted by having to wear Peter Weller's suit for number two. They must have made some adjustments and changed the, the design of the suit in terms of its look. They sort of spray painted it more with silver, so the sort of bluish look of number two. But all in all, I mean, th these sets are definitely worth hunting down and getting as soon as possible. If you know, if you if you're a big fan of the big fan of the movies um, but if you're just a you know casual fan of of the movies then they're still worth picking up because there's a lot of stuff on there that hasn't been discussed before hasn't been you know revealed to the public and the behind the scenes stuff is really interesting so 
it's definitely worth the money. Um, but I'll put links below in the comments. So if you live outside the States, you know, I'll give a link where you can buy it from. And if you live in the States, I'll just put a link to the uh, Scream Factory website you can order it directly from them. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I will be back with some more videos soon. And if you enjoyed this kind of Blu-ray discussion, um, if you want to see more of them, let me know in the comments below. I do hope you pick up the upcoming release of Virus and Lawnmower Man. Uh, because I do want to review Lawnmower Man. But the thing is that the film never had a soundtrack release. The soundtrack's brilliant for the film. Um, but all we can get is the soundtrack to Lawnmower Man 2, which is a dreadful film. But the soundtrack is incredible. It's, it's one of those rare things. A bit like Robocop 3, you know, where you might not like the film. But the score is fantastic. Because Basil Baldurus, you know, come back and, and did some new music for it. But hopefully, and if you want to see more of these types of videos, then I'll do a discussion on Virus and the Lawnmower Man. Okay, everyone, take care, and I'll see you all soon. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel. And also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.